to see each one of you here today. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with some singing. Please take your hymnals and turn with me to number 203. Number 203, the windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight, this morning. This morning doesn't fit with the rhyme, but we'll sing tonight anyway. Um, if you would, let's stand together. If you're able, we'll sing through this twice. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Let's sing it again. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Amen. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and I'm going to ask uh, Brother Rice, would you please open us? Amen. If you'd remain standing for our pledges, Judah, come up here and help me. Awesome. We'll pledge to the American flag, the Christian flag, and the Bible. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. And then to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. You may be seated. As you are, keep your hymnal out, please, and turn to number 240. Number 240, The Lily of the Valley. Let's sing the first and last of this song together. I found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. Let's sing out. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, 
His blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. Turn over a few pages. To number 250-250. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. If you came today with a burden, I pray that you can give that to the Lord. He's the burden bearer. I preached on bearing burdens, and really he's the one that bears burdens too, isn't he? Yes. Cast your burdens on him. Let's sing the first and last of number 250. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary. is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. present help in time of trouble. Thank the Lord for that. Let's take a look at birthdays and anniversaries this morning. Birthdays and anniversaries. And uh, today's the 18th. So we had some this past week, birthdays and anniversaries. Um, Miss Donna Tyner celebrated a birthday. And Vidalia Turner, she's in the back. And Brother Mott had a birthday. And I think that's it that's in here. All right, let's go ahead and sing happy birthday to Brother Mott. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation, and then you'll have to. All right. Vidalia, happy birthday to you. You're welcome. <laughs> she came in on the end of it. All right. And anniversaries this week. Do we have any anniversaries? Um, the Burgers and the Johnsons. I think the Johnsons have headed back. And um, the burgers, I don't see them this morning. They may be joining us later, um, but continue. I got a message from the Perrys that they're headed back to Maine today, so keep them in prayer. And I know some, some more of our snowbirds will be headed north. Um, the Rices, or were you just waving at me? Okay. Oh, man. Okay, well, we'll miss you. We'll miss you. And um, we're glad they come back every, every year, so we're going to pray. Yes, sir. Be in prayer for Linda Peacock, her family up in Maine. Um, her brother was killed. He's a logger, 
and many of the family up there is not saved, so be in prayer for that family. Thank you, Brother Stahl. I appreciate that. All right. We'll keep that in mind. Keep them in prayer. Please do. And um, this time we'll dismiss our children to Sunday school. Um, The rest of you, if you would please, take your Bibles. I will be teaching Sunday school this morning. And so I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 20. No, I didn't forget. I'm preaching through Exodus on Wednesday nights. Okay, I'm, this is not a sermon from Exodus. Um, but I wanted to teach on something this morning that hopefully will just uh, clarify and add some help and it's not going to be the end all um, of, of this subject, but Lord willing, it'll give some framework. I want to preach on a subject of Christian ethics, Christian ethics, or building a Christian ethic. You know, recently in our country, I say recently, within the last how many years, I don't know, since 60s, with the revolution, um, so many different revolutions, morality is being rewritten. Yeah. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Um, the scripture says in the end times that wrong will be right, right will be wrong. We're there. We're there. We've been there for a long time. It's becoming more pronounced. Um, and so how do, how do you know what is right and what is wrong? How can you dictate? How can you decide? Um, is there right or, a right and a wrong? Some people say, well, it's, it's, it's completely um, uh, subjective. They live in a postmodern framework their worldview is postmodern. They say it's right when, when society says it's right. And so they allow the consensus to determine morality. If the majority of the country is okay with it, let's do it. If it's legal, do it. And if, it, if, if the majority of the country is against it, it must be wrong. We'll call it hate speech or something like that. And so they begin to legislate and turn things into morality that really are not moral or immoral. And other areas of morality, as long as everybody's okay with it and it's hush-hush, it's fine to do. And so for a lot of folks, morality, what is right and what is wrong, is it's like nailing a, a, a noodle to the wall. You ever try to do that, a spaghetti noodle? Uh, they don't really have a framework. Uh, most of you here this morning, you have very clear convictions. I'll use that word. I'd like to give some framework to that word as well today. But you have convictions about what is right and what is wrong. And whether you know it or not, you have built a Christian ethic. But I just want to give some distinction today in how that we do that. Because sometimes we are faced with an issue where the Bible seems to be silent on it. And people say, well, there's no verse that says you shouldn't do that. How can you as a Christian say that that's wrong? And then I would ask you as a Christian, what do you tell them? How do you describe it? Um, sometimes nowadays the word legalism is thrown around. Somebody that has rules in their life or if a church has expectations or standards, people will say, well, that's legalistic. What is legalism? And I think it all comes back to this issue of Christian ethics. Why do some people have convictions? Why, do, why, why can two Christians love the Lord and have two different sets of convictions in some areas? How does that happen? Well, they're obviously a compromiser. Um, yeah, maybe not. So let's take a look at this. The Word of God does tell us what is right and what is wrong in several areas. And so we're going to work our way through a graduated scale of building a Christian ethic. And I hope this is helpful we may have differing opinions in this. And by the way, I'm not going to be um, solving all of your questions. Hopefully this framework will help you so that you can navigate according to your conscience. Um, one, of the, one of the Baptist distinctives is something we call individual soul liberty. Do we believe in that? Yeah. Yes. If you're a believer, God's Holy Spirit indwells you. Do we believe that? Yes. yes. And the Holy Spirit can take the sword of the Spirit and allow you to walk according to the Word of God, guided by the Holy Spirit. And you can have confidence, and you can live a righteous life. First of all, I want to take a look at something called precepts. How can you know what is right and what is wrong? Well, the very, the very basic foundation 
is precepts. And of course, we're in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 is where the Ten Commandments are. I think it's very telling that many people want to take the Ten Commandments out of the Supreme Court. They don't want any record of the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments is the very basis of moral code. Those things should be understood as being right and wrong, regardless of how old you are, what background you come from, And so the desire to get rid of them is really a desire to throw off any restriction. Like it says in Psalm 2, they they shake their fist against God and say, cast off the bands. We don't want you ruling us. Nobody can tell us what is wrong except us. And you see that today. Look at what God tells His people. The first commandment, we think of the commandments. A command is something that's very white and black. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. It is right or wrong, right? Ten commandments. First, he says, no other gods. Thou shalt have... God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So God outlaws polytheism. Only one God. Him. That's it. Next, he says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So what's he telling us there? No idolatry. Don't make an image of God. By the way, when people make statues of Jesus, I don't think it's wise So let's not do that. You can't contain an infinite God into a finite statue. And you'll begin to impose things onto God from your observation of the statue. You know, look at the statue and look at his eyes. And oh, he's so, you just made that with your hands. All right. The God that we worship cannot be bound by that. So he says, don't make statues. Don't worship me by means of trinkets and things. He's an invisible God. He took on the form of a man. But that was to relate to us, not so that we could relate in worship to Him. No graven images, no statues, no taking the name of the God God in vain, that's what it says next. All these things, we can read through these and we're on the same page. It says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Use it empty like you would a filler or verbal clutter or as a swear word or, or just use it for endorsement. I'm a Christian and then you live like the devil. No, that's taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So far, these are simple laws. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So you're supposed to work six days and rest one. Right? Isn't that what it says? Remember the Sabbath day. Work and then rest. We're going to talk about that in our finance series. Working and resting. If we were to read on, we would see the commandments... Honor your parents. No murdering. Thou shalt not kill. It means to murder, okay? No adultery. Fornication before marriage, uh, um, unfaithfulness within marriage. Adultery is obviously wrong. Uh, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Don't fixate on something God has not given you. Those are commandments. Now, you would say, as we look at those commandments, it's pretty obvious what it means to obey those commandments or to disobey those commandments. These are still right. Would you agree? Yes. That's the very basic. So can we know from God's Word a framework of what is right and wrong? Well, we can go to the commandments. Um, Now, Jesus, He made a statement in Matthew, and you probably remember this. Uh, The men came to Him and they said, Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Because the Ten Commandments were built upon, and the Ten Commandments expanded, become the Levitical law, which were given to Israel. The Mosaic Covenant, the Levitical law, is an expansion and application of the Ten Commandments in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So God took those and expanded them, and they had hundreds of them. And the Pharisees added to them, and so they came to Jesus, the lawyers, those who really wanted to obey the law and do what was right, and they said, what's the most important law? We're going to get him. You know, there's 300 of them or 400 or however many you know. You know what Jesus said? He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, 
with all thy soul and with all thy mind, with your desires, with your feelings, with your thinking. Mark says, with all thy strength, too. So with all thy serving. This is the first and great commandment. But then he goes on. He says, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he applies these commandments. Now, on face value commandments, you'd say, Pastor, that's cut and dried. We should obey every commandment in the Bible. I've heard people say, every promise in that book is mine. And that sounds like a good song, but the fact of the matter is, it's not really true. Did you know that not every promise in the Bible is yours? If it is, then some of you grandmas right, might want to start redecorating your nursery. Because at 90 years old, Sarah had a baby. So let's go ahead and get ready, ladies. You say, Pastor, that's... I, I, well, except for that one. Okay, but how would you know that? You have to apply them, listen, within context, right? And when you look at a commandment, you must ask yourself several questions. Who is speaking? Because there are commandments in the Word of God that are given from one person to another person. I don't have to obey those. That's from another person. Okay, say, okay, well, obviously not those commandments. Ah, but it's a commandment. So let's be honest and let's, let's look at these by context. Another one is who is being spoken to? Is it an individual? Is it a nation? Is it a group? Or is it to all people? Now, God did give commandments to certain individuals that only applied to that individual, to that nation or to that group of people. God commanded the descendants of Abraham to observe the rite of circumcision as a means of setting themselves apart. Now, other people at that time did so, but for medical reasons. They did so on the eighth day for a spiritual reason within the Mosaic Covenant, which would later, Abrahamic at that point, Mosaic later. So there was a specific class of people. That commandment does not apply to Gentile believers. Medically, maybe, but not biblically. Adam and Eve, God said, don't eat of that tree. That was a very specific context, right? We're not even in the Garden of Eden now. God told Noah to go build the ark. Was that a commandment from God? Yes. And so you see, there's more to it than sometimes we pretend. Sometimes we as Christians know these things, and when we present our convictions from Scripture, we're not careful... And what it does is it causes confusion for the lost or for the, or for the young believer. They're left floundering. They don't know how to, how to create their own Christian ethic. And so you say, Pastor, my goodness, this, this is requires thinking and studying. Yeah, it does. Uh, Timothy says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when we come to these and realize, it, some people would say, well, I think we should obey all commandments in, that were given to Israel. Well, that's pretty awkward because some of you are, are wearing shirts with different types of fabric. Polyester is a blend. Israel was not allowed to do that. Israel was not allowed to eat clams. I like clams, all right? Israel was not supposed to sow seed that has mixed seed. Well, I've bought the, the wildflower seed and sowed it in the yard before, and that's not a sin, all right? And so you understand that certain commandments are given within a framework for a certain purpose, and we have to seek to understand the Word of God. Commandments are very cut and dried, and we need to understand, does this apply for everyone for all time, for only these people, or to me? And did God ever rescind or change that law? Now, I, I, I think it's important because sometimes people will say, well, if it's ever been wrong, it's always wrong. And I like what that means. God does not change. But sometimes God says that law was for a specific time, but this is a different time. God does do that sometimes. Now, we, should, we shouldn't do that. That's not our... We can't look at society and say that. Um, God gives commandments for all people, the Ten Commandments, but He does change some commandments to His people. Uh, take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 10. Acts, chapter 10. Now, if you're new here, you don't have the benefit that most of our people do. My people, you know me, you trust me. I'm not leading us on a path of, you know, leaving the faith. I want us to be honest with the Word of God, okay? And so as we take the Word of God, I do believe the Word of God gives clear direction. 
But we as Christians need to be careful in how we present it. Acts chapter 10, look at verse 9. On the morrow, it was as it was when off their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. I do this sometimes when people are talking and I don't really mean to. My kids were talking to me the other day and they said, Dad, what are you looking at? And I guess I was like in a trance staring at the table, you know, like that, like Peter. So he was in a trance. Well, in this particular one, God showed him something. He saw the heavens open and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So it's like a zoo. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He was hungry. This was great. A barbecue on the roof. I want to be there, right? (laughs) Invite me if you have one. Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common nor unclean. Hmm. They had certain laws as Jews. They weren't allowed to eat unclean meats. There's a group of Christians today who believe that it's against God's law to do this. I call them Christians because I believe some of them do believe in the resurrected Jesus Christ and they're saved. Their church, their church teaches work salvation. I've met uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventists who are believers, and I, I think I'm going to see them in heaven. But they're confused on this. They think they have to obey the Old Testament law, and so they place themselves back under this. Well, God said, eat. He says, I'm not allowed to eat. So God says, look, if I've called it clean, don't call it unclean. The voice spake to him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call thou not common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Emphasis, three times the number of emphasis in Scripture. Now, what God does next is he tells Peter, go to the house of a Gentile. That's right. And see, they were not supposed to do that because they were unclean. He's changing those laws. God gave them those laws for a specific time, for a specific purpose, and then God Almighty, through His revealed Word, changed them. And so those things did change, and we as Christians take that for granted. I don't think many of you have a, have a conscience problem when you sit down and you eat uh, pork ribs. I certainly hope not, because if you do, give them to me. I'll eat them, and it doesn't bother my conscience at all. Amen. We understand this, but we understand it because God changed it, and it's written in His Word. There is a record of it. And so we need to allow God's Word to dictate those things. Okay, so the commandments, I understand them, there's a context, I apply them, and I know what is right and wrong. That's good. But what about something that there's not a specific commandment against? What about, what about those things? Does the, Bible give more con- does the Bible give more guidance? Yes, it does. I'm glad you asked. And, and so we go from precept, which is the foundation, we go to principle, principles. Principles, I would define this way. A principle is a timeless truth that when applied gives guidance to my actions. I take a principle from God's Word. It's an axiomatic truth that is true regardless of where we're at, what language, what country, what people group, uh, even if the person is not a believer. These principles, they're true, okay? A truth from Scripture that when applied gives guidance for wise behavior behind the law, beyond the law. Here's one. Take your Bible and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I'm not sure how far I'll get today. I'm, I'm going to be speaking next Sunday in Sunday school as well, and so we'll continue with this. Don't get upset if we didn't finish, but um, we're going to go through a couple of these principles. I've preached through principles to live by before. There's many principles in God's Word. I'm only going to name one, two, three, four... Uh, probably five. Maybe more. To give you an idea, this is not an exhaustive list. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The Word of God here is talking about us and how we should live. And it says this, What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. God created man and woman. And after he brought Eve to Adam, Adam said, Ah, this is now bone of my bone flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, man with a womb. Okay, by the way, by the way, there's woman and there's man. You're born and you don't change it. There's no such thing as transgender. 
That's, that's a made-up word, um, and, and that's it, man and woman. Okay, let's move on. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Um, oh, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Why are those things, why is he talking about that? Well, look what he says. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So in the discussion of morality, he says using your body for morality or immorality, I should say, is dishonoring, and you shouldn't do it because it doesn't belong to you. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit, and revealing this for the first time to the church there at Corinth made them look at it a different way. This principle then, it goes beyond just sexual immorality, doesn't it? See, if my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, if I'm supposed to glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are God's, it really, it really dictates how I should live and treat this body, how I should care for it. I should be a good steward of it, right? And so that principle then has to be applied. And we begin to look at our actions, our interactions, what we do, is this glorifying to God? Things that might be socially acceptable, um, that nobody around me might have a conviction against. I might need to ask myself, okay, is this honoring to God? Is it using my body this way? And so that principle gives us guidance, and it has to be applied to you, okay? Here's another one, the edification principle. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, look at verse 12, edification. He says, all things are lawful unto me. Now, within the realm of what is lawful, everything that is lawful is lawful. That's what he's saying, okay? There were many things lawful back then in his day, and he's saying, in the realm of all this stuff that I'm allowed to do, there's a number of things that I, as an American citizen, can do, all right? You understand that. But just because it's legal... Does that make it moral? Just because it's legal and maybe I can justify it, does that make it a good idea to pour my life into? Well, how do we know that? Well, look at what the Scripture says. All things are lawful unto me. Somebody say, well, I'm not breaking the law. Okay. But all things are not expedient. Is it really a good idea? All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. There are Christians who do things and they say, well, it's not against the law. And what they don't realize is this activity that they're getting involved in may be addictive. You know, it's not against the law to gamble. You as a Christian can go to a casino and you can gamble and you're not breaking a law. Right. And if you're saved, you'll still go to heaven. But you know what a gambling is? It's addictive. Yeah. It's addictive. It's addictive. And by the way, I'll say this, not to step on any toes, but gambling has all different kinds of modes and methods. Some people gamble on sports. Some people gamble on the lottery. Some people gamble on the stock market. Stock market is legitimate if you're investing, but if you're treating it as a gamble, a get-rich-quick scheme, it's going to hurt you. It's addictive. Okay, so it's an application of that principle. I don't want to be brought under the control of any. Let's move on. Verse 13, meat is for the belly and the belly is for meat, but God shall destroy both it and them. Hmm. So this might even apply to eating, how much I eat, what I eat. Okay, now I'm stepping on toes. We're Baptists. We love potlucks. But the Bible's clearly against gluttony, right? So one person might have a problem with gluttony. Another person might not. And so this principle, when applied, may, may result in a different behavior between two different people. Are, are you understanding? Yeah. It needs to be applied. The Lord is for the body. It says the body's not for fornication. Okay, that's completely out, out of the question. But for the Lord and the Lord for the body, God hath raised up the Lord and will raise up you by His own power. We need to ask, is this edifying? All things edify not. What is edifying? What builds me up? What's going to help me along my path to become more like Jesus Christ? What's going to help other believers? Is this expedient? Is this going to control me? Edification. And right on the heels of that, we go to the appetite principle. Look at Romans chapter 13, a couple pages to the left. Romans 13, verse 14. The appetite principle. 
temple, edification, and appetite. And this is where you have to get really honest with yourself about your personal temptations. We're all made of flesh. We all have temptations. And some of us have temptations that are similar, but others may have temptations in an area that you don't, and you may be tempted in an area that I am not. Because of your upbringing, if you lived for... I, you know, when we get saved, if you, I got saved at three years old. I was not a professional sinner by three years old. I was a sinner. I just wasn't very good at it, okay? If you live until you're 23 or 33, it's possible you have drank more fully of the sin of this world. And that there are addictions, there are temptations, there are memories that you have because of that. And so you might be tempted in an area to go beyond where someone else is not. So friend, you need to be honest with yourself applying these things. Look at Romans 13, 14 says, it says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Your flesh remembers some things that somebody else may not even know, have no desire to do. It, there's not an area of temptation. But in your life, in, if you're going to apply this, you say, you know what? This action itself is not wrong, but it would put me in the location to be tempted to do something wrong. It would awaken an appetite that I've been battling and I have, and I know that if I put myself there, I'm going to place myself in the way of temptation. Are you with me? Yes. Do we understand each other? And so the recovering alcoholic may need to avoid some places where it's fine for me to eat. Now, if I'm eating with him, I'm going, to, I'm going to steer clear of that place too because the weaker brother principle is also in the Bible, all right? We're not going to have time for all of these, but I think you understand that biblical principles, the appetite principle, the association principle, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, avoid all appearance of evil. And I don't believe that applies to things, okay, this, and you might disagree with me, and I still love you, and that's okay. Um, I believe this applies to associations today. In other words, avoid appearance of evil. Sometimes people will say, well, I can't partake in this, I can't partake in that, because don't you know, hundreds of years ago, this is where that originated. And I go, no, I never knew that. I never made that association. So there's really not an appearance of evil there. There would have been hundreds of years ago, but there's not today. But I'll tell you, there are, there are appearances of evil today. Things that some folks, I look around the, the room and many of you have gray hair, there are associations today that you don't even know about. They're growing all the time. And so we as believers have to be careful about those because society is creating new associations to evil and they don't even think about the other ones. If something has an association with evil, it can damage the testimony of a believer. And since our function is to bring glory to God, we should refrain from actions that would associate us with evil. I, I personally, um, some people struggle with Easter because of its origins. And they say, well, pastor, nobody here at our church has done this, but I've talked to other believers. I don't even think you should use that word because don't you know it originated in ancient Babylon? And I say, no, because I wasn't there. <laughs> I wasn't there when they were worshiping that false god, and neither were you. In fact, you only know that because you read it somewhere. There's not an association between our celebration today and that ancient ritual. And if we want to apply that association, you're going to have to pair out a lot of things. In fact, uh, the months of the year are named after Roman gods. The days of the week are named after Roman gods. We're going to have to dig and get rid of a lot of stuff. Nobody's going to know what we're talking about anymore. So we have to be careful and honest when we apply the, the principle of association. If something is evil, if it's causing a, a conscience issue, then friend, should we avoid it? Yes. Should we guard our testimony? Yes. yes, we should guard our testimony. Men, as it pertains to you, you should avoid being alone with a lady that's not your wife or your mother or older relative, you know. You got, you got to apply these things. It's not black and white. We need to be careful and honest with ourselves. You have the weaker brother principle. If something's causing another brother to stumble spiritually, I should be more concerned about my brother than myself and not do something that would cause them to fall into sin. The Scripture says that. 
Stewardship principle, everything we have really belongs to God. And as a steward of God's resources, I should take care of my life, my time, my treasure in a way that brings glory to God. Those are principles. And principles have to be applied in each situation. They they require more discernment. You say, this is requiring a lot of thinking. Yes, yes it does. It requires more thinking. And it requires us to be awake and on guard because you are the light of the world, Christian. And so somebody comes to you and says, well... The Bible doesn't say it's wrong to drink alcohol. Show me the passage where it says, Thou shalt not drink alcohol. Do you know what I do? I take them to some principles that talk about appetite, and they talk about control, and they talk about what wine does. And I say, when you apply these, these are things I don't want in my life. No, there's not a verse that says, Thou shalt not drink a Budweiser. (laughs) It's not in there. But if you apply the principles and you say, this is how I apply the principles, it's pretty clear, is it not? I believe it is. If applied correctly, they can help me live my life with wisdom, suffering fewer consequences of wrong actions and behavior, and enjoying more blessings for God of good behavior. The Scripture says in Proverbs 13, 5, it says, "...good understanding giveth favor." but the way of the transgressor is hard. You know, the word transgress is an interesting word. We use the word transgression. And sometimes every word that the Bible uses for sin has a slightly different force. The word sin translated means to miss the mark, like you're aiming for the bullseye and you miss it every time. Some of you are archers like that. Some of you never shot a bow and arrow. But guess what? When it comes to sin, we miss the mark of God's holiness every single time. Did you know that? The word iniquity means to take something which is given and to twist it into something that's bad. And that's really the way that we do with a lot of sins. We twist something that would be good and we make it bad. That's what the flesh does. The word transgress means to go beyond or to step over the line, to go too far. And I love that word because when it comes to your life and to mine, this right here, we're going to say, is is the precept. It's the commandment. It is... If I step over that, I've sinned. That's transgression. And so principles are like the signs on the side of the road. If you're driving down the road, I'm going to add some next week, so come back next week, we'll finish this. You're driving down the road, and it's a windy road, and you see a warning sign, and the warning has like a squiggly line on it, okay? It means it's about to get windy, and then it has a suggested speed limit underneath. Suggestion, all right? If you disobey that, You haven't gone over the cliff yet, but you're a lot more likely to. That cliff is sin. The sign is a principle. You've got to apply it, and you've got to know your limits. The car you're driving, okay, I'm going to slow down because I want to be wise. I don't want to go over the cliff. Now, we still have precedent, conviction, and standards. We're going to talk about those next Sunday, and I think it's time to stop. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us as we desire to live lives that honor you, to understand where we have freedom. And Lord, there is much freedom serving you. Oh, thank you for that. Help us not to have our made-up, man-made rules and pretend they're yours. But dear Lord, also help us. Help us to realize where you do require us to be different from this world. And dear Lord, both are true. Give us joy as we serve you. Bless these folks here this morning. In your name I pray. Amen.